Hello everyone and welcome back to the Gerben Research Development Exploration and Expansion Space Program and the first episode in my new series, Destination Duna, which Matt Lown has already started, but I figured it would be fun to do my own. Maybe I'll rename it to like Dawn of Duna or something. But anyways, this is the first mission to the Duna system for my new program initiative, I guess. This is going to be a robotic fold-out space station that goes to Ike, low Ike orbit. It will be roughly equatorial, and it should provide a nice base for all of our Ike operations in the future. You can see there that I am adding lots of science stuff, even though I don't need it like I usually do. And I really think the station turned out pretty good. There's a few things I would improve if I made a new one. But overall, it doesn't really matter because we still haven't made a Duna station. And there you can see I'm messing around with like how the radio tower should work, if I should have different radio towers. And then eventually, I get to the solar panels. I think that's maybe now? No, I'm doing more reorganization. I think it looks a lot better like that than it did the other way. I kind of want the MK3 command pod to be at the top of kind of a module. Then you can see me there adding the solar panels with symmetry on one side, and then you can take that whole like kind of chunk and make it symmetrical and place it on those two sides. However, it didn't work because of that weird thing in the middle, I don't know what it's called, but it doesn't use symmetry for some reason, which never made sense to me. And then you, there you can see I added robotics to the solar panels, then realized that they didn't fit, so I had to move them all. But, like, solar panel arrays are, like, the best place to use robotics for, because even if you're using monopropellant to move the other modules of the station into the right places, it's just so easy to fold up some solar panels, and it's so much more efficient and easy. And it means that you don't have to have, like, a solar panel array with a bunch of monopropellant thrusters and batteries and probe cores and stuff. It just makes it so much more simple. However, for this entire design, because I don't really like using monopropellant, I went ahead and tried to make the entire thing robotic. Makes it look a bit unrealistic, because there's a few different chunks where Kerbals wouldn't be able to move between because of the robots, like robotic arms and stuff, but I don't think it matters too much. It's mostly about what the station looks like, and if it was a fun mission. And also, I imagine that the Kerbals can just go on EVA every time they want to visit the others. There you can see I'm making some more modifications, and here we are at the launch pad. Hello to those of you who skipped the construction. This is the um, rocket I developed to get the station to Ike. I think it's pretty good. You can see I'm initiating the gravity turn. I think usually you're supposed to start turning faster than this, but I think it worked pretty good for this rocket. And there you can see me punching through the clouds with this epic rocket as we ascend towards the Carmen line of Kerbin. I don't know why they like it isn't referred to as the Kerman line. That would be so much cooler. And there you can see the three Kerbals or an, and more on the station as we exit the atmosphere. You can see the apoapsis is pretty high and there we go just past the Kerman line. I'm just gonna call it that now and you can see the atmospheric effects disappear as we see an epic cinematic shot with all those boosters still in the background. Uh, the main rocket core couldn't get the station up into orbit and then all the way to Ike, so I had to add more boosters, which is the best solution for anything in Kerbal Space Program, even if it um, risks your Kerbal's health, but that doesn't seem to matter to anyone, except those who do care about it then they do care about it. And then there's another cinematic shot with clouds and the fairing dispersing. I always try to do the clamshell deploy on the fairings because it's so ugly when I don't, but it actually ended up looking pretty good. And then we can do our circularization burn at Apoapsis. We had to, I had to reduce the vector on the vector, the vector gimbal on the vector engines to make sure the ship didn't wobble our control. You can also see the array of fuel tanks I have positioned for the upper stage. And then there's actually another upper stage that's kind of sandwiched in between those two other stages. It's pretty small, but it actually helps a lot. I think it has a Rhino engine, 
which the Rhino engines are really big, but they're actually fairly efficient and they just strap right onto the bigger um, fuel tanks. So they're very convenient for stuff like this. And then you can see now I have skipped ahead to where uh, the ejection burn is. So now we can eject on an inter not interstellar, interplanetary trajectory to Duna and that epic shot of the ship flying by. I think that type of shot's really cool because it just shows how fast the ship is actually going. And then this is that rhino stage I was talking about earlier. It actually provides pretty good thrust to weight ratio. I mean, it has to because it's a really big engine, but yeah, it's pretty good. Well, not necessarily. It's just you'd expect that big of an engine to have a good thrust to weight ratio because if it if it's like if there's a nuclear engine that big, like there wouldn't be a nuclear engine that big because efficient engines seem to be smaller. So that's yeah. I don't know where that tangent was going, but here you can see me planning my encounter with Ike. I decided to plan an encounter that would go straight to a low Ike periapsis instead of capturing at a periapsis below Duna, just because I'm not sure if it's more efficient, but I guess it is. Then you can see this shot with Duna kind of moving back and forth across the screen as we come towards it. And then we can also make a correction burn. So I think this is also a pretty cool shot coming up here. It's like the ship is drifting through space. It's pretty epic. Also, you know that rocket I was talking about earlier that got this whole thing here? There are a few explosions, which you'll have to watch my music video to see. That's coming out on Friday. And then, um, shameless self-promotion aside, we can now continue our time warp towards Duna. And Ike as well, because we're not going to Duna, we're going to Ike, which is kind of weird in a series about Duna, but hey, we're going to need to have, we're going to need to explore the um, moon of Duna to fully understand Duna itself. Maybe we could come up with some fake theories about how Ike formed. It's kind of interesting because Ike compared to Duna, because like, if you compare moons to the planets that are around, like, the ratio is usually pretty small, like, Pole is really small compared to Joule, but Ike is actually the biggest relative moon to any planet in the Kerbal system. It's also extremely mountainous, I believe the highest peak is around 14 kilometers, which is really high, especially compared to, like, places like Elu, where some of the highest mountains are maybe 6 kilometers. I know a lot of the flats on Elu are 3 kilometers, but... Ike is extremely mountainous, which means rovers are really cool. I'm probably at some point going to try and redo my old Ike rover video from last year. I think it turned out really good and it was one of my favorite videos, but I really want to redo it with this whole Duna series and maybe I'll put a new twist on it with the robotic, parks, robotic parts that came out in the new DLC last um, May. And then we can see here that I'm just doing some small burns to capture in a as close to circular as possible Ike orbit. And then another cool cinematic shot of the ship kind of doing nothing. It's just sitting here in majestic glory with the sun and a sun flare. And yay, now something exciting to talk about. We've got that final correction burn to round out our orbit. The Kerbals look bored. They've probably just been sitting there for so long. I think, yeah, the mission's been going on for over two years, so they're probably, like, they just want to, like, I don't know, if I was a Kerbal, what I'd want to do right now is probably use my EVA jetpack to go down and land on Ike. However, although Kerbals have enough Delta V in their jetpacks to land or get into orbit from Ike. They don't have enough Delta V to do both. So my Kerbals could go down there, but they'd have no way of getting back up, which would make for some very sad Kerbals just stuck down there, depressed probably. I imagine they'd be sad if they were stuck down there, but they're probably almost as sad stuck in this station. Well, at least it has, like, Netflix and downloaded Disney Plus movies. That's always cool. And now you can see I'm deorbiting this kind of fuel module. There's actually, um, that's onion staging drop tanks there. And 
And there was so, like, I so overbuilt this mission that I had an entire extra stage of fuel and, like, 2,000 Delta V, I think, left when I ended up destroying everything. And then for somehow those nose cones survived, but then they also got obliterated. And now, an epic cinematic shot of the um, robotic space station unfolding. And then also the solar panels, the scanning dish, and the other scanning dish unfolding from the station as well. I think the station with the solar panels at least looks way cooler than it does without the solar panels. I always like having big cool solar panel arrays on all my stations because it just makes it look like a station. Like the ISS without solar panels would just be, I don't know, a brick in space, but the solar panels and the radiator panels are so iconic to its look that without solar panels and Sometimes radiators. I didn't include any radiators on this one, but basically without any kind of cool paneling, a space station is just lame and it shouldn't exist. And if you've ever built a space station without solar panels, then you should subscribe to my YouTube channel because I want you to. And it shows your support for these videos. To be honest, like, subscribing doesn't really mean what it used to with the whole notification thing added because I think when you used to subscribe you just get everything they post but now you can subscribe and say no notifications and it just I don't know it just I don't know what it really means but to me it means a lot because it means that you enjoyed the videos I make enough to actually click that button even if you don't turn on notifications I'm still grateful for any subscribers I get because it shows that you're at least interested in my content. And then you can see there another shot. I think this shot turned out really cool with the solar panel. And then I also designed the station where the cupola module would be able to point down at the planet of Ike and get some really cool pictures of the surface. With the 1.8 texture updates to the Mun, Minmus, Duna, and Ike, I think this Duna and Ike series is going to be really cool because all the textures are updated, all the planets look way better here. And like, Ike especially, like, look how good that looks, it's so high resolution, it's amazing. And then, yeah, just more epic shots, and there's a shot of Dune. This is my favorite shot of the entire episode show. And now, here's the end shot. Um, thank you for watching, in the top right is the last video I did, the Moho Mountaineering music video, really recommend you check that out. And in the bottom right is a direct link to subscribe to my channel if you feel like you want to see more of these videos. Thank you for watching. Bye!